five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to episode number 17 of the Art of Move podcast with myself, Anthony Manuel, my good friend, Dr. William Raybar. We're out here in the Canadian Rockies trying to find the truth of human movement, the grand unified theory, so to speak. And yesterday we were talking a lot about different movement and training systems that we used to do, like bodybuilding, gymnastics training, powerlifting, CrossFit. Uh, we did the Edo Portal method. We were kind of diving into what we liked about it, what we keep from it while in our own movement practice now. Uh, and, and then we kind of peripherally sort of scratch the surface of what exactly we're doing now. So we, we have movement practices. I, I mentioned that I do a little bit of hypertrophy work, but I have a, a movement practice that's more focused on integrating movement as opposed to just training for like maybe a, a singular goal. Uh, and, and the goal that we kind of have now is to move better. And within that sort of goal, we've kind of identified there's like, in my mind, there's almost like a holy trinity of popular functional movement systems, which are functional patterns, the WEC method, and GOTA, like the greatest of all time athletes movement systems. And I wanted to talk about those three movement systems and how they've kind of influenced us, what we think they're getting right and what we think they're lacking a little bit. And... Uh, just kind of dive into our own experience with those three systems. I know we both have peripheral experiences with them uh, and in-depth experiences with them as well, but I wanted to talk about those. Let's start with WEC method, and you can kind of explain WEC method a little bit because I actually don't, I've never uh, taken any courses from David WEC. I've never uh, really seen anything of him other than a lot of his coaches and him on Instagram. But what would you say is his sort of main idea or main goal of focus when he's training people? Um, efficiency and movement, right? So balance, efficiency. Um, he does dip into power a little bit with the side bend. And you'll see this with the Landmine University guys. Um, it's pretty popular, guys with the landmines going sideways. He's really about the side bend. So he calls it the royal coil, and he has a certain motion that he does with it, but it's really about bending your spine and allowing your spine to bend as you move. He, he trains this in an isometric way, holding still at first, so you recognize the position. Then he gets you to move from side to side, so you recognize both positions, so you can work one side, you can work the other side, or you can transfer sides, okay? So that's kind of how they structure things at WEC method. You can work single side, um, or you can work a double side, like a traditional lift, two feet on the ground, holding both sides, or you can transfer the energy from side to side. And that's really what differs from a lot of systems. Um, you don't see CrossFit with this, bodybuilding, yoga, there's none of that uh, transfer from side to side. So that's really where efficiency comes in because you're walking 10,000 steps a day, no matter what. And we're not even talking, cool. getting into sports. It's all transferring energy from side to side efficient, efficiently. And that's what he goes for. Hmm. So what I'm hearing is uh, the main focus is the things that you cultivate are the ability to side bend because that side bend is part of that, that, that coiling side to side is part of the locomotive pattern. Um, it also helps your ability to transfer weight from one side to another. So unilateral weight transference um, and proper stacking of your weight over the joints. Um, and that creates more movement efficiency. And so WEC ultimately is about uh, movement efficiency. Some of the other things that I've seen him do in terms of his upper body, um, you know, a lot of the rope work that he promotes kind of promotes a lot of free movement through the spine. So if you're thinking spinal engine theory, as you know, the spine being a prime driver of locomotion, then increasing spinal mobility and spinal efficiency is going to help improve and, and rhythmically as well. Like he does a lot of work with like rhythmic movements through there. And that's sort of, you know, that, you know, if you're swinging a rope around the weight of the rope kind of promotes a rhythmic swinging, right. And uh, you know, he has his pro pulsers. So he uses shakers, shake, like, <laughs> the shake weight is a meme at this point, but it's actually like, it's almost like, Morocco style shakers that give you this sort of rhythmic feedback to how rhythmic you are. And then he, you know, he, he'll work a lot of elastic recoil through the shoulders for efficiency in the actual arm swing of the running pattern. So you're using less muscular energy and less force and relying more on the efficiency of elastic recoil through your fascial tissue. Those are the things that I've just 
peripherally observed without actually doing any WEC method. And so in your practice now, what aspects of WEC method have you integrated? Well, I've integrated uh, most of it because a lot of what WEC method does is a lot of what Goda does and a lot of what functional patterns does. Um, I don't think they'd like to admit that, but there is a lot of carryover. Now, let's unpack what you were saying before with the um, spinal engine and how WEC uses it. Again, he uses the side bend. One side of your body, the rib cage, is compressing down. Okay, And what you want to do on that side is that's the same side as your landing foot, by the way. What you want to do is contract the lat on that side. That's what he used to do quite a bit. Okay. And what simultaneously while that's happening, because you're bent sideways, the other side of your ribs is expanding and creating a lot of potential energy to snap back. So if you can match this with how you run and how you move, you can harness the elastic recoil from your ribs, from your thoracic spine and use that to propel your movement and make it more efficient. Okay, and that's really what he's teaching with the rope. And if you really want to make that side to side motion efficient of your ribs, of your rib cage, then you want to go in a figure eight pattern. It's not a direct side to side motion. It's a figure eight. Okay, so that's where the roping comes in. You're passing energy from side to side trying to create a figure eight in general. Okay, now you can bring WEC method into the lifting world by just adding weight to the side bend, okay? So that's what a lot of lifters are doing. In fact, um, his top trainer, Chris Chamberlain, says that that's how he got into, when he met Weck, Weck showed him the side bend and he immediately PR'd his deadlift, okay? So the side bend has immediate applications into lifting, they claim, right? I haven't played with that as much, but I do like the side bend isometric hold. I still use that all the time. Now, I'm, I combine this a little bit with stretching at the same time. So I'm really thinking about uh, stretching using the side bend. Hmm. So the side bend, what, what uh, fascial line would you be stretching using a side bend? Like, like just even in terms of like if I bend to the side, I lift my arm overhead, I can feel my whole like line down my lats along the, the medial side of my body. Like I can feel that kind of opening up. But what application do you use for stretching with the with the side bending action? Well, I, I hold isometrically, and I actually use um, it's like a bamboo pole, and I push against the bamboo pole, so I have uh, pressure, and it's trying to force back out at me, right? Because I'm pushing against uh, an elastic pole, and at the same time, I'm stretching my ribs, so I'm pulling one side tight, I'm contracting on the other side, and that gives me a nice feeling of what it's like to where my max contractions are and where my max tensions are. Okay, so then I can start recognizing that and passing the energy from side to side because that's what I ultimately want to do is transfer it into movement. Um, did you have a, a more specific question with that one? Yeah, actually, let, I'm going to pivot a little bit. That's yeah. what you include in the WEC method is a lot of the side bending principles and you, know, you have the shakers and, and I see you doing some of the roping stuff. Um, where, where do you think the WEC method is kind of misguided or what do you think they're missing? What, what parts of the picture are they not seeing? Ooh, um, it, that's hard to say, right? Because it's debatable, very debatable. Like I haven't, I don't know everything that WEC knows, right? So he's obviously onto something that, you know, a, a lot of things that I don't know about. But I would say I, I like the way Goda does the lower body mechanics and how they parse it out compared to WEC method or functional patterns from what I've seen, right? So it's not like they're missing a lot. I think they're way ahead of the game still, but I just like the way Gota does it better in terms of the lower body, and that's kind of what I model off of. Mm. So David Weck would be better at looking at the mechanics of side bending, maybe even some upper body efficiency, uh, but you would leave the lower body mechanics stuff to Gota. Um, in general, yeah, I think they do it uh, better and they do it more simply, right? The, uh, mm. They're saying a lot of the same things, okay? Weck says green dot on your foot is where you land. Gota says the pivot point. They're pointing at the same part, the outside of your foot, um, the fourth and fifth metatarsal. So they both have the same areas. They just say it in a different way. Head over foot mm. means being in your columns, having your head, shoulder, head, shoulder, 
um, or sorry, your head, your hip, and your ankle all in line, right? So yeah, again, the language is over your columns or head over foot. They're doing the same thing again. I think functional patterns does this as well. So anyone using the spinal engine pretty much has that uh, thought process behind them, right? So um, I really can't think of anything I dislike about WEC method. Just my personal opinion, they go into lifting a little bit more than I'd like now because he's very much about efficiency, right? Um, David Weck himself is more of an inventor. So he's out in the forefront doing some crazy thing. Like to, right now I'm taking his hand course and you look really funny running down the street doing his hand maneuvers, right? But they are more efficient. So, I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of like that. Right, so his guys do more lifting, and he does more of the uh, artistic side of it, creative yeah. side. Almost like a mad scientist kind of, yeah. That's, he does have that. Know, there's always personalities at the forefront, right? Like there's obviously David Weck at the forefront of Black Method, Nadia Aguilar at the forefront of um, of functional patterns. There's Coach Gill and Ricky, and like all the head coach guys at, at the forefront of, but mostly Coach Gill is the founder. You know the OG of OGs of Gota, and they're all characters, right? They're all like uh, I find that more often than not, when you're talking about these three methods in particular, there's usually a problem with the person who discovered it more than there's a problem with the actual method. That they're talking more about the person more than they talk about the actual methods behind them. Uh, you know, and and it's easy to dismiss functional patterns because you don't like Navi Aguilar, for example. But functional patterns is full of great information and full of incredible uh, angles for training. Um, you know, how far into the functional patterns world have you kind of dived into, dove into? Um, so I've taken half of his 10 week course. I've taken all his like fundamentals uh, back in the day. Um, basically every single one of his YouTube videos I've probably watched. So, I mean, that's, that's as far as I've gone, right? And I obviously have played with a lot of the concepts, so I, make them my own um now mm -hmm. on a deeper level he talks about chamber sequences what i think he means by this is basically getting parts of your fascia to coincide okay so to be linked together what i would call synchronizing together or dancing together right but he actually wants them to connect so i think what he does is holds them isometrically using different different force lines so let's say his cable he'll hold something with his cable he'll make sure the whole line of what he wants is connected that's his chamber and then that's where you see the shakes a lot of the times you'll see his videos and you'll see the shakes that's what that is he wants you to hold those positions until you fatigue so you really recognize them and then you can start using them in integrated patterns mm. Yeah. yeah, one of the, one of the things the approach that I see Naudi taking and like for for those listening, what I did was I took his ten week course and I looked at his functional. I did his all, like anything that you can buy from him online except for the para bar workout basically because I didn't have a para bar. I wasn't going to spend money on both the workouts and then spend the money on the actual para bar just to start doing it. Um, although I'm curious, <laughs> you know, I could like part of me wants to because I like experimenting with everything, right? But I did his, Which one's uh, I did his functional bar? training. So the para bar is um, on the cable machines that he uses. It's a long bar with an attachment on one end of it, and then it's a lot of rotational movements. And so he has, uh, you know, he has the para bar workout, which are movements um, to work different planes of motion using the para bar. Um, yeah. The one that I have mostly function uh, mostly focuses around dumbbell movements and cable movements with just a normal handle. Um, but like a continuous cable machine, not like, you know, something that you do tricep rope extensions on, for example, you need like a specialized type of machine that has, uh, you know, a very fluid pulling system. So, uh, you know, I, I did that. And what I, what I saw with Naudi is he, he looks to address dysfunction first, and he's kind of obsessed with everything that uh, causes a person to be degenerated, right? Anything where... There's a big emphasis on weight bearing, uh, that weight transference thing that kind of Weck talks about where you want the head over the columns. Now he kind of has the same idea where, except his angle would be you're kind of paying attention to transferring your weight without hiking your hips up in one direction, without having you know different things pull and dump into joints in, in inefficient ways. Um, so you know even his 10 week course, he'll start with a lot of myofascial release to address 
making sure that your posture is proper so that you can, uh, there's a lot of postural analysis work that he sets the foundation with before you even get into any of his training stuff. In fact, he, he will reinforce a lot that like, you know, the foundation of this is learning how you're supposed to distribute weight, learning how your posture is supposed to be. And then from there, you can start addressing dysfunction even on a, on a more deep level with actual integrated movements. Um, so, so I see it's a lot of weight bearing efficiency more than, uh, and, and his whole, you know, he, he has the functional patterns core four, standing, walking, running, throwing. So everything that he does is to try and, you know, optimize the body for those four functions, you know, standing being the principal one where he's looking at posture and it's like, okay, well, if you, if you're, your fascia is too bound up here, you've been sitting here and you're holding patterns here, then you're going to have this sort of pelvic tilt and you're going to dump into your spine. And it's, it's kind of like, it's looking at inefficiencies in posture first and foremost and weight bearing first and foremost. He doesn't really address um, gait mechanics in the same way that, you know, doesn't optimize for gait mechanics by observing motion in the same way that Gota does. Um, yeah. But the, 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 the sort of angle, and we have mentioned this on a few other episodes, I think he almost reverse engineered uh, the anatomy trains sort of model where he's looking at these, these fascial lines. And like you said, you, you know, you're trying to find those connected points where the, these tissues are, are interconnecting and then can be used in an integrated way. He's like one of the few, he was the first person that I ever saw to use integrated movement as the main focus as of his training system. He, you know, he, he still trains slings like elastic slings of fascia and stuff like a lot of his, um, swinging dumbbell work is trying to maximize the efficiency of elastic recoil and fascia. Um, and he, he's very, very intelligent in terms of how he systemizes it. Um, what's, what was your kind of experience? Is, is, did you disagree with anything? Am I missing anything there? No, those are great points. Um, yeah. So the, the secret is that in go to or functional patterns, you really have to do a lot of groundwork first. If you actually want to be good at them, you know, like you have to learn to stand in functional patterns. Um, you have to learn, you know, how to use your feet in go to, right? Like if you really want to do it and, and do it right. Okay. But with functional patterns, I used his, uh, his book. What was this book called again? Power, posture. Power of posture. Yeah, so that made me realize a lot of things, and I started playing around with it at the office a little bit, right? Like, I learned a lot in Cairo. It was very similar, but um, we learned a little bit more about a static model, okay? He was getting into a little bit more of a dynamic model, but in my opinion, he was still focusing on sagittal plane. Like, with the hips, he, he was never originally talking about the hips rotating and moving in fluid motions. He was talking about anterior and posterior tilts if you look at his old work. So was everybody else though, right? So that's the way I thought before. If you look at my videos on YouTube, even like last year or the year before, I was emphasizing anterior to posterior tilt. Now I'm like, wait a second, no, it's how it actually rotates in three dimensions and how it goes around the corner and how smooth it is at doing so is the key, right? So now he's actually saying that now. How much fluidity do you have in your hips? Are your hips acting like they're kind of like, imagine this, you're in a pool and you watch like uh, the hips or the hips are like a boy floating up and down yeah. or you have a hard step and your hips are slamming up and down, right? So a lot of people are slamming their pelvis and rib cage up and down in a jarring fashion. Okay. So that's where he's saying people aren't fluid. He sees rigidity, rigidity everywhere as a dysfunction. He, need, he wants to get fluid literally back in the tissue by getting you moving correctly over a period of time. To get rid of the dysfunctions okay um so it's a it's a way to do it and i think he's on the right path with that right and it is kind of like next level thinking fluidity versus rigidity right and that's kind of how i look at things too like i can watch your pelvis move as you're stepping and then how does it react like against the ground reaction force so when your foot hits the ground is your pelvis all of a sudden jumping up fast I don't want to see that. I want to see your foot hit the ground and your pelvis do a smooth wave, right? If I was measuring by the crest of your hips, I wouldn't want to see it move quickly. I'd want to see it move more in a wave. Okay. So he's along the lines of making movement smooth all over the body. And I would add too that there's that that's not to say that there's not room for addressing 
posterior or anterior pelvic tilts because they can be yeah. over exaggerated and they ca can cause movement dysfunction, right? Like you, Absolutely. you still want your pelvis set in the right position first to start learning that sort of cresting that again, that figure eight pattern that seems to keep repeating in, uh, in, in these functional movement discussions, there seems to be, it almost seems to be spirals and figure eights. It's, it's infinity. It's the, it's, it's like the most hippy dippy shit ever, but it's real. You just, you, all you well, have to do is observe it. Right. So yeah. the, you know, so, so what functional patterns tends to miss, what do you think functional patterns? What do you think Naudi big picture is missing in his, well, his approach? Um, focusing on dysfunctions all the time, right. Which is what, uh, the physiotherapy world, chiropractic world, medicine world, everyone, you have to diagnose something, a problem, right? So you're always looking for the problem. Uh, someone like Weck, usually, I, I don't even know if Weck does an assessment. He's just like, start roping and try to be smooth with it because the rope's going to feed it back to you. You know what I mean? You're going to start to move your spine. So everyone can somewhat move their spine. And if you can't, then the rope will show you, you'll be hitting yourself with it, right? So basically... You have a tool that's so easy that you can see how smoothly you move within the first 10 seconds, right? So he doesn't even go into that world where Naudi, I think, looks at a person is like, you're dysfunctional here, you're dysfunctional here, you're not smooth here. Um, we have to address this, 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 and this. We have to address your standing and your posture for six months before we even get started, right? Like I'm exaggerating there, but it's kind of like that, right? And he may be doing it the right way. I'm just saying that it's a criticism, right? Now, I don't know his actual assessment as well. Um, someone like Goda, for we're instance. Not, we're not a human. We didn't take his actual, we didn't, like, no. disclaimer, too, by the way. We're not certified in any of these methods. We didn't go and take their courses in depth. Um, we're movement observers and practitioners, and we've we've bought the we've we've invested in in all of these courses, but we're not, we, we don't teach them at any level whatsoever. We just have done the methods um, and, you know, worked with some people who have developed the methods. But we haven't, we're not certified in any of these things. I'm, right? I'm certified in WEC method, uh, RMT ropes, the ropes, the pulsers and his uh, elasticity, which we can talk about as well, right? But um, that's the only thing I'm certified in. I just look at the work and try to interpret it. Uh, this is basically my opinion of what their opinion is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it's like, it's interpretation, right? That's the, we're trying to find truth in ourselves. And that's why we go through all these different methods without having that. Like the, I think the issue too, with becoming a functional patterns coach is that you have to sign non-disclosure agreements and you can't actually, you know, like the reason that we don't know what Naudi's assessment or like a functional patterns coach assessment would be is because it's all hidden behind non-disclosure agreements and, and things to protect now these intellectual properties. So, you know, we're, there's, there's a lot of speculation based on our, our experience with the systems uh, what we see them talking about, what we see the results of the clients that they're posting. Um, it's a lot of observation and opinion. And, you know, just like, I like to, I like to be transparent about that part because, you know, sometimes people will listen to like one person's opinion and they think that we represent who we're actually talking about when we don't. So, that was something I just wanted to just just throw in there, just you know, gingerly pepper in. <laughs> they're they're all um, all three systems look at gait. They they do assess gait, and their founders really uh, obsess over it, right? They all have their little take on it, but it it is all gait at the end. How you run, how you walk, being efficient. Um, again, functional patterns looks at it as where are you inefficient, where are you dysfunctional. What methods like let's make this efficient and fun. Uh, go to like, there's a math to this. There's an actual right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. You want to be within the code of the right way. Let me show you how it's done. Okay. So, um, that's a little bit of a nuanced difference between all of them. I would say too, that, you know, functional patterns would presuppose a right way to do things. Uh, they have a right way to stand. They have a right way of weight distribution. And there is like a, you know, biomechanically, there there's certain ideas that functional patterns has where there's a North Star of being, quote, biomechanically sound. And that's how they address dysfunction, right? Like the standing and the posture and those basic ideas in, in, and even the gait cycle. Um, there are still ideas, but they aren't as clearly or simply laid out as, as say, Goda would be. You know, go uh, let's let's go into Goda because go, we've, we've fuck, we're Goda fanboys. This is 
we can almost call this like the go to fanboy podcast in some in sometimes because we we love the system um but there is but i do i we will talk about the things that we feel are missing from it in a second here go to lays out a bunch of principles right and we've repeated the principles over and over and over again what we like about them is that they're very very simple um inside ankle bone high so the ankle bone that's on the inside of your foot is going to be high which kind of means you're sort of lifting up that inside part of your foot that arches up nice and high uh your heel is away all day so it means when you step you pivot off that outside of your foot uh and you're in in that pivoting action your front foot sets a bow and that heel away is a corner so it's 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 uh you know you have your your heel away all day your bow in your corner you have your inside ankle bone high you have your weight stacked over your columns which is the same thing as david weck saying head over foot um what else am i missing here uh i mean back chain dominant they all say that too right. like that's huge no, nobody's addressing this anywhere else like that that it's so simple to just stay back chain dominant all day and these are the only three systems addressing it especially go to um who emphasize this in their actual assessment it's like your hips must be behind your rib cage and that's how to move forward and that's what like it, that's it period there's no other way to do it okay so you can just feel this if you put your hips in front of your rib cage you're going to feel like if you let tension go in your body you're going to fall backwards so the most simple lowest hanging fruit but behind rib cage okay so i, I love that from them and, and that doesn't mean like curve your lower back so that your hips start hiking back behind you. You still want to keep good spinal posture too. That's that was something that uh, that I started playing with a little bit, and you know my my partner kind of pointed out. It's like you're kind of walking around like Donald Duck a little bit. It's like oh, I'm back chain dominant, and then we kind of played with my spinal position a little yeah. bit, and then all of a sudden it was like from my heels all the way up to my like neck basically I could feel the tension in my back chain just by tucking my pelvis a little bit but still keeping my um my chest slightly a, a ahead of my hips without that that doesn't mean you pull your hips back that means you keep that nice neutral spine and you lean your hips your lean your your ribs forward floated above your hips a little bit it's not a lot it's a little bit and that's a great point you just made because it's there's a difference between tilting your pelvis which is rotating it and shifting it which is moving it back and forth you want to shift it backwards a little bit and your rib cage simultaneously forward a little bit we're talking like the most minor amount right the more faster you go the more you're tilting right and unless you're sprinting full tilt and then you go more upright but basically um you want your butt behind your rib cage not tilting it excessively okay I do like a little bit of an anterior pelvic tilt, but your butt has to be shifted back first. Okay. Um, now that that'll vary amongst people, like how much they actually have to tilt and, and you have to play with your tensions there. That's where a system like functional range conditioning becomes really good in that you learn to move each joint specifically in uh, like standing still, right? So you learn to control each of your, uh joints starting with your hips and your spine i really emphasize this uh to pay, to almost every patient too because that is the easiest thing to do to learn how to control um standing still the articulations of your of your ribs your hips um and uh functional range conditioning does this best i think mm. yeah i mean like functional range conditioning is is focused on that individual joint articulation which is very very useful when you're trying to adjust you know micro positions in your hip if you can articulate your vertebrae one by one for example you can set your spinal posture and then you can you can slowly kind of like eat that 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 proprioceptive awareness if you have dysfunction and you you're starting to move you're trying to figure out what these positions are for example for me getting into uh a, a, an authentic back chain dominant position where i actually feel the tension in my calves and my hamstrings and my glutes all the way up my back it required me to like really micro organize my my vertebrae and my lumbar and my thoracic spine it, it required like little micro adjustments and even in those micro adjustments i could feel 
where I had tension in my front chain, which were which was stopping me from from wanting to be back chain dominant. Um, and and that again, like that's that's a very useful part of the system, right? If you can, if you practice articulation, if you practice individual joint awareness and joint movements, then you're going to be more apt to be able to set yourself in these favorable positions, these favorable postures, and be able to kind of like set yourself better, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great practice for body awareness. It, I look at it almost like lifting, like being able to move your individual joints, like I look at lifting, in that you should be really, really good at it. You should be a master at it. But once I've mastered it, I can kind of just need to check back in on it, right? Because I don't need, like, I think FRC, in my personal opinion, you can articulate your hip and your shoulder for like two hours straight, you know? And, and then you forget to actually integrate it into movement or you're literally putting all your time into joints. Now, there may be periods of your life where you need to do this, post-surgical, um, you know, learning at first, if you don't know how to move your joints and you're not very, very good at it, you got to put some time in, right? So that would be the point to really concentrate, you know, a few months on learning how to put your joints in, uh, how they actually articulate mechanically. How is this supposed to move and do I have control of it? And if I don't, it's a problem, right? So yeah, it's like lifting, learn how to do it, be a master at it. Once you master it, uh, let it, uh integrate with other things like actual movement and actual movement efficiency that's where like WEC method go to functional patterns and uh soon to be what i'm releasing uh that's going to be where that comes in right so uh basically i would do it like that learn how to do it learn how to articulate your joints be a master at it yeah and and, and you know like one, one of the things that people who become very invested in functional movement and prioritizing gait above everything else, they can miss out on a lot of nuances of other systems because they will put horse blinders on, right? And again, that's that's the sort of the point of this whole podcast is to avoid doing that. Uh, we want to talk about the the intersection between these two things. You know, one of the one of the things that I love, it's funny, I, I made a tweet out about our last episode, and one of the tweet responses that someone had to, to our last episode was, you know, I love the approach. I've been very into the Edo Portal method for a while and I love it, but having that go to lens made it very easy to learn some things and link them together more fluidly, right? And so, you know, go to sort of gives you this idea of the, the human system as, as this chain where you, when, when you start to understand the lines that, uh, that make up the bows that you eventually corner and they, you understand this pivot system and you start to understand how your body can transfer energy efficiently in a spiral it transfers to other things as well, right? Like when I'm roping, I use, like you said, when, when we rope now, we use go to footwork. We use that pivot point on the fourth and fifth metatarsal to sort of transfer that energy from side to side when we're swinging that rope in the figure eight pattern. We're just transfer, we're, we're using those, the, that feet and that bow and corner mentality. I will still, I'll corner in my, in my body while I'm doing the roping, you know, like that's something that I just inherently do now. Um, and, I think Goda's lower body mechanics are spot on. Again, they've watched like tens of thousands of slow motion videos from some of the most elite athletes in the world, indigenous cultures, uh, babies fresh out of the womb. They're sort of observing these movement patterns that make up locomotion. And they determined, you know, the people who are staying injury free are the people who are untouched by the modern quote conveniences that like make our, <laughs> make our modern life more comfortable things like shoes or sitting in chairs or, uh, you know, heavily padded shoe uh, or yeah, the heavily padded shoes, the sitting, even now training where we're focusing on lifting weight off the ground as opposed to moving weight forward. Um, anyone who's untouched by these patterns, you're kind of, you're, you're in a, a situation now where you're, you're deprogramming yourself from your inherent movement code, right? Like human beings have like a, a blueprint of how to move, right? And Goda's theory is that you decode yourself out of this blueprint the more that you're indulging in these modern conveniences. What I like about that approach is that it sort of gives you a North Star of natural movement, right? And when you're talking about function, what is gonna be more functional than the way that our bodies were designed to move? 
if there is a way that our bodies were designed to move, either an evolutionary basis or, you know, a design basis for the ultimate efficiency in, in how our bodies are meant to exist, Gota kind of has the North Star to it, right? At least in terms of lower body mechanics. They also observed the patterns that you shouldn't fall into based on watching a ton of slow motion video on the patterns of people who are getting injured all the time, right? So if you avoid those patterns, you'll stay more injury free. And if you avoid coding those patterns into your nervous system through the, you know, different conventional training methods, then you'll avoid those situations, right? What do you think? Do you think that GOAT is missing anything? Because there's a few things I think, but I want to get your take on it first. Yeah, like uh, something like what ATG is doing, and that's the uh, getting tissue, like being more specific with how you create tissue, right? So FRC emphasizes this, so does ATG. Go to might. I'm not certified. I don't, I don't know their intricacies, right? But different tensions will have different implications onto your body. Andrea Spina says it best. Force is the language of the cells. If you want, uh, if you input a certain force, your cells will respond. Go to adds in, do it in the right angles. That's what I love about it, right? But they don't have specific tissue training like ATG does or um, other systems, maybe functional patterns, I, I would say, is specific tissue training in terms of the fascia, right? Um, I don't think GOTA emphasizes this very much. I don't think they emphasize upper body mechanics as much as uh, WEC in terms of like getting reps with ropes and, and clubs and stuff like that. I think that's very valuable, although I think they have it correct, GOTA, that footwork is first. You have to get the footwork down first. And that is harder than it sounds and less sexy than it sounds, right? But if you can gain power out of your foot and not leak any energy out of the foot and ankle complex and have smooth motions there, uh, for me, it's been a huge game changer. I was leaking so much energy out of that area. So I think they have that correct. Um, yeah, I can't really think of too much else. Maybe you'll jolt my memory there. Yeah, I think I think the upper body mechanics thing, you know, uh, again, my experience just for transparency is I've taken some of Gil's video courses. I've done the decompression course, the basics course. I've done some of the locomotion courses. Um, I do the Recode 225 workouts program by Gary at the GLS training facility. And one of the things that really surprised me is a lot of their upper body training is just uh, push-ups and bench press. And like they'll do push-ups on their slant board so that you have the the, the angles and everything. But I still think that those rotary mechanics that they teach in the lower body are relevant for the upper body. They still do some side bending, but it's very minimal side bend. Again, they're trying to maintain those angles. They have that 22 and a half angle. That's what 225 and Rico 225 is. 22.5 degrees times that by two is 45 times that by, you know, four is, is 90. And then you get like the full 180, you know, like the full 360 eventually. It's like a fra it's fractal math. That they're, that they're basing this on and that fractal math is based on observations and actual measurements that they've taken but you know like you're you're, you're side bending to like 22 and a half degrees and that's and you do reps with that but there's no there's no application of force like you said either so that application of force too with uh, with the roping and that recoil training that's a little bit lacking the the nuances of rotary mechanics in the shoulder are also lacking. So, you know, the, it's like a chin up and a push up. Those are good basics. And I think anyone could benefit from doing them in general. And yeah, maybe you're, you're doing better because you have your hands angled and it's not just flat. So you're not internally rotating your shoulder, whatever it happens to be. But there is that, uh, that element of like, look, if you're training these, these rotary components of the lower body so intensely, and you're thinking about how, how does your upper body fit in with the spiral math and how can you optimize that? I think they could think about that a little bit more because they have that lower body gate mechanic so locked in, right? So it's like, how does the upper body integrate in that way beyond just doing push-ups and pull-ups? I don't understand how push-ups and pull-ups could necessarily translate to a faster sprint. Yeah, that's a great, all great points, right? And I think that with uh, Recode 225, what they do over the internet, like I haven't actually seen it, but what you're describing to me, pull-ups, push-ups, bench press, those are all double bow, double corner, right? Very simple motions, um, easy to code over, or easy to teach over the internet, right? 
But eventually, if I want good movement, I want to start taking it for a ride. I want to go back and forth, get my spine involved. So basically, it's like being in push-up position, I'd want to start crawling, right? Like mm. that's how I would want to integrate movement in the lower body. Instead of just repping out push-ups, I want my body to move through space, right? So I'm still getting the strength and and all that, but I'm moving. I'm actually getting movement. Now, I don't do a ton of that. The I do more crawling and simple crawling patterns as like a way to have basic strength and at the same time rehab my body, right? Be very gentle with it, okay? But um, yeah, I agree with you in terms of upper body mechanics. They can definitely go a little bit further with it and uh, maybe it's a purposeful thing that they're focusing on lower body mechanics because I do agree that that's where you should start to put your energy into. But I like Weck method at the same time where he's like, just grab a rope and start playing. Look at your body. Like to me, I want to have fun with it. Be more like a kid, explore, use my body like that. Have no limitations of what I'm told. Move in this linear way, tilt this, move that. It's like, I've had enough of that, right? There is a period of your life where that is relevant, but explore and have fun too at the same time. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why I like the Edo Portal method for a lot of stuff. But I think the Edo Portal method, diving right into it without addressing dysfunction first. And it's funny because this is, this is like the FP, the functional patterns almost philosophy. It's like address dysfunction before you go and do complicated stuff. Like I think the Edo Portal method just encourages you to just move. But the issue is there are still wrong ways to move. There are still ways to move that'll injure yourself. And what most people do when they start a movement practice is they'll go and they'll do things that feel good in their body that, that basically doesn't cause them pain, which usually accommodates their dysfunctions in the first place. Um, you know, like I love, or used to love, I used to love squatting and deadlifts because I was fucking good at them. And I was like, oh, just, it's what feels good for my body. Long-term though, it caused so much spinal compression and so much, like it could cause me so many injuries and gait dysfunction that my hips were always sore and my back was always sore. Even if I, you know, no matter how hard I braced, no matter how many J curls and, you know, like range work and, and mobility exercises and foam rolling and lacrosse balls I'd fucking dug into myself with Theragun sessions, it's like in order for me to keep doing this because I quote liked it because this is what my body wanted and it was part of this practice, I was still having to reverse the damage just in order to keep doing it, right? So I think... You know, that ex, like, I think you earn exploration, right? And even in the Edo Portal method, they talk about isolation, integration, and improvisation, right? That's the, that's the three step sort of philosophy in, well, you, you, you isolate the, the parts in your body so that the tissues are well conditioned enough that they can withstand the force of getting into these positions. Then you can integrate, you can move from position to position and that, that, then it can start flowing. And then once you have a bunch of different positions and a bunch of different transitions, then you can start improvising. I think the same thing applies to functional training. I think it's like, learn your basics, uh, including, you know, learn how to fucking stand for one, like stand with good posture where you're not like, and, and honestly, a good way to tell, like I, I learned that my standing dynamics are not that great because I've been working at a standing desk now. And my lower back and my hips started to hurt. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Something's a little janky about my standing mechanics. I got to do some work. I got to release some fascia. I got to do some, uh, you know, some real investigative work on on what's happening with my posture that my weight's dumping in in the wrong ways. Why am I? Why why do I hurt just standing here for four hours? Right, barefoot normal normal stance like how why why is it that my weight is being distrib distributed this way well um i mean people f pick up all kinds of dysfunction so it's hard for me to say over here right but you're not supposed to stand still for four hours that's the thing you're supposed to move yeah. within that time it doesn't matter if you have a job or not or your job demands it your body doesn't care but eventually it will uh mold that way your nervous system will accept it and then you just become really good at sitting. And when you try to do something other than sitting, it becomes a problem, right? So basically you're supposed to move all day. Now standing posture to me is literally just getting a position. It's as simple as that. It's to me, I call it a position to go to, an anchor position, understand how to stand. And then from there we can move out of that. 
Okay, I want you to understand how to stand by getting your joints to understand where they are. Basically, FRC training. Uh, moving each individual joint, understanding where it is, aligning it, and then we're moving on from there. Okay, so um, there really is no hack for standing. It's having an integrated uh, movement practice within your day. Or instead of standing, you're in size of position for 20 minutes. You're sitting for 20 minutes. You're back up to standing. You, you can't just stand there and expect no problem. Um, let's go back to um, the Edel Portel method because I spent a little yeah. bit of time doing it as well. And uh, the just move thing, um, one, Edel Portel method is so fun, okay? So I can see how you can get addicted to it for a long, long time and, uh, and all that. But the problem is, number one, you're not a monkey, okay? So like being on the ground, and, and like walking on your hands, it's great. And I use it sometimes, but not 90% of the time. Okay, and I'm, Ido Portel was a copywara specialist before he became famous, right? So we had, let's say 20 years in dance and, and complex motions. Yeah, he can just move, but there's a lot of people who can't just move. And their joints literally don't have the range of motion to get down without uh, injuring something. So an FRC, like a functional range conditioning, would look at that and just like cry and, and just hold their hands in their, like, yeah. Um, how could you do that? How could you move in those ranges of motion when your joints don't even have the ranges of motion to get there in the first place? You're going to be compensating all over the place and eventually hurt something. This is what happened to me. And it, like my injuries weren't bad, but I was definitely feeling tweaks in my knee and um, I was already somewhat athletic and able to do things. So I was like, you know, starting spinning and doing all that stuff. And I was exploring and just having fun, but it was coming at a cost, right? So anyone getting into that, make sure your joints have the ranges of motion to move the way you're trying to move. Um, realize that this isn't exactly a functional practice in that in reality, 99% of people that aren't in a specific sport are on their feet all day and only on your hands to do exercise basically, or, you know, if you're a mechanic, then it's your job. But that, that's yeah. a, you know, I, I do want to, I, I want to put a caveat there and, and that's to say like, don't confuse Ido Portal and what you see him doing in videos for like the actual method. Um, there is a big emphasis on crawling and, and locomotion patterns in crawling and being on the ground. But you know, there's, there is a lot of standing work. He has a lot of gymnastics stuff. So, you know, Ido Portal, I think, is, is trying to be good at fucking everything from uh, from an owning your own body perspective. There is a little bit of external load manipulation as well. But again, the core of the philosophy that I really saw was isolate, integrate, improvise with so the three eyes. Um, and, and so, you know, like from from that perspective, you would not get into some of these positions before you owned them. That said, a lot of the criticism of the Edo Portal method is that they don't often honor that and they kind of rush ahead and they end up doing too much volume or they throw too much crazy shit at you and you, you jump levels, right? And, and the movement culture, there's not enough guidance. The just move thing is not enough of a framework for actual, you know, effective progress in terms of movement efficiency or even, or, you know, like the movement exploration. Like some people get away with it. But there are countless people, including myself, and sounds like including you, that ended up having some injuries from pushing, uh, you know, trying to emulate the cool things that people in, in Ido Portal's movement culture were trying to do. Yeah, to be fair, like if you emulate the best go-to guys, if you emulate the best whack method guys, the best FRC guys, you're probably going to get hurt too, right? But the, the principle does come down to if you don't have the ranges of motion to get into those positions like on the ground and most people don't that's a thing especially if you're in your 30s or you know people who are looking at this and trying to do it it's your time is best spent doing something else however it is fun so I, who am i to say i'm just saying from my own experience here and what i would do is go into a functional movement uh where you're on your feet and that's where you're starting understanding how your body is as it stands and moving from there Okay, and the specialty stuff, I look at almost like gymnastics. Okay, so gymnastics is great. I, I find it so fun, but it's a specialty thing. It, it, you're not yep. holding a planche ever, unless you're holding a planche. 
you know? So a lot of that applies with the Edo Portel stuff. And again, it's so fun that I can't say not to do it, right? Or not, not yeah, even try. Well, and, and, and again, like when we're talking about trying to find the truth of movement, it's like do whatever the fuck makes you happy ultimately, but understand that the goals that you have will probably have some consequences as well. When we're prioritizing gait mechanics and functional movement above most other things, it's mostly because our goals are around longevity and movement efficiency first. Um, and for me, like I still do gymnastic strength training a little bit. I still do some handstand work. Uh, but the, the key here is some, right? Like I, I'm uh, constantly trying to address dysfunctions in my body and optimize my gait first. Every moment that I stand, like people are watching the live recording on nofilter.net probably see me like kind of swerving from side to side. I'm not, I'm not standing still. Like I, I record these podcasts standing now. Um, you know, Will gets into different SESA positions and he'll, he'll sit in, in different functional positions within his chair. But like, I'm, I'm like, I'm fidgeting around a lot. And like, even when I'm standing at my desk, like I do that too. My movement practice is an all day thing. It's not just like the, you know, the few hours that I'm spending training for certain goals. You know, like I, I still, I still do flexibility work. I still do strength training. I still do hypertrophy. I still do gymnastics. The latest thing that I'm going to start getting into is dance. I'm going to start learning how to fucking shuffle because that's fun, you know? And again, it's like movement still has to be fun. If you're just thinking like, if you make it sterile, you're like, wow, like, wow, I'm like so efficient at walking. It's kind of fucking boring. Uh, oh. Unless you're a, a geek like us, right? Yeah. To be honest, I probably have, uh, most of my movement is within a fun context. Like martial arts is really how I outlet things. So I do footwork all the time complex patterns, weaving, ducking, uh, spinning, uh, lots of that. And that is so fun. Once you get it, you can integrate it into a dance, right? So dancing and boxing go hand in hand, right? So I'll be shadow boxing, breaking into a dance, back to boxing, um, working on the, the principles, the footwork. Um, yeah, so it, it's a fun time too. Like I'm having a great time, but I'm also spending an hour every once in a while, you know, every every day for me. Okay. I'm not saying to do this or that you have to, but if you put the time in, you get the fruits, right? So I'll walk around and just feel my feet along the ground. I'll do things like that as well. Right? So it's really an integrated type of thing. You should have a fun aspect of your practice. That should be an absolute must something that you can outlet functional movement, but to your satisfaction. Dance, I I highly recommend learning a basic way to dance. Shuffle's great. Hmm. And, uh, you know, like, that's, like, we can get really technical on this podcast, but ultimately we're, like, we do this because we enjoy it. Like, we're not we're not just trying to, like, bog you down with academic or, or like, overly analytical theories about movement. We're, we're talking about movement, for fuck's sake. It's the most embodied personal thing that you could possibly do, and that's, you know, from a philosophical side, I mean, like the reason that I'm looking for the truth in movement is so that I can enjoy being in my body more and I can do more fun things with it. Ultimately, if I can optimize for gait pattern and I can move really fluidly, then I can dance more and I can get in a, you know, some, some fun positions with my partner and we can do all kinds of crazy shit with your body that you wouldn't be able to enjoy doing. And you can continue to do that right up until the point that you fucking die. That's the real thing. It's like how, how long, are we going to be able to enjoy our, our bodies and how can we move and train in a way that we ultimately respect that? That's really, you know, for me, that's why we have these conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, we, we laid out kind of how to get here, but ultimately you do want to have a fun outlet, right? So you do have to put in work, but you can do it as you're having fun as well. Right? So again, um, martial arts, dance, are the two things that I would recommend as an outlet. Um, well, I like yeah. even, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I went to a, a ska show when I was young. I listened to a band called the planet smashers. My partner and I both listened to them when we were young. And it was one of the things we connected on. And so I went to Calgary and I went to go to this planet Smashers show and there was a mosh pit, right? Like everyone's just dancing and we just bounce off each other to this crazy music. And I was trying to think of my foot patterning go to style while I was in the mosh pit. And what I found was that my transference of energy, instead of getting launched by these people, I could corner the energy off people and I could fly around, I could dance, still get bumped into and I could like 
efficiently transfer the energy instead of like, you know, collapsing super hard and having that impact in my joints. I was able to, you know, like apply these principles of efficient movement to just something that I was, you know, I, was, I danced literally for four and a half hours straight, which would be a lot harder if I was, you know, a little less efficient in my movement, a little clunky through my hips and was taking all the impact through my joints, right? So it's, it's applicable to real life, putting the reps in and the work in to create movement efficiency. One of these things is really, really nice. You know, like you kind of, you want to move towards that ultimately. Um, so if I was thinking of, you know, applying some of the principles of these movement patterns in sequential order, I think starting with the go to footwork is like first and foremost where you start, right? Yeah. Get the footwork, understand inside ankle bone high and understand a bow in a corner. And then like get the footwork done first. Like you don't have to you know, like ignore everything else about Goda and just focus on that for a little while. From there, where would you go? Oh, uh, it's that's hard to say, right? It depends on where you're at, but uh, understanding your columns, head over foot, okay? Understanding that you're okay to let your spine move back and forth a little bit. It does, you don't have to be rigid, okay? And that'll open up some doors. If you want to take it a little further with the upper body, the easiest way to in start integrating movement, figure eights, I'll say this over and over and over again, look up roping, rope flow, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Octo moves, David Weck, myself, Tim Sheaf, uh, Chris Chamberlain, those are just off the top of my head. YouTube, that, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Figure eights for your upper body. This is how your body moves within space. Overhead figure eights, or what you do are overhead motions when you're throwing, striking, underhand, you could strike like that as well, but that's more running, okay? So integrating patterns into your upper body after you figure out the footwork. Bow and corner, your hip uh, and your leg create a bow and they always go into a corner. So I shouldn't say they always go into a corner, they don't if you don't know what you're doing. But if I could separate just two things, now all, all I think about is going from a bow to a corner, and it's simple. I have two motions to do. It makes everything real simple when I just think of my hips. And so, yeah, like for so so let's so we're talking sequ sequential path of learning functional movement essentially, and how to get, get reps in your bank. Um, start with the go to principles. You know, get your inside ankle bone high. Learn how to bow in corner. Um, get 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 an understanding of your columns, aka weight distribution from side to side. After that, you can throw in some roping. Because you're going to get that nice fluid undulation of your spine that's going to work your spinal engine while also having the awareness in your feet to maintain those sort of go to principles. You will, you will be in your columns and you will be inside ankle bone high and you will bow and corner as you're doing that figure eight pattern and you're going to be training that spinal engine at the same time. When I started combining those two, it was like walking felt like I was gliding. It was really weird. It was a very, very interesting experience. It's hard to describe unless you actually experience it yourself. But do some roping so that you have that figure eight undulation naturally happening or naturally patterning into your spine. My uh, The way I run now – sorry, yeah. go ahead. I said the way I, like, I run now and the way I move, is it's, it feels totally different now that I understand where to place the weight on my feet and how to pivot. Okay, how to actually like use the pivot point system that GoTo talks about. It it feels so much better, but it I can't really describe it unless you try it. It's one of those things that you really have to do yourself to really understand the nuances of how to do it. So basically, inside ankle bone high. Keep it high the whole time. At first, it might be so difficult for you because you don't know how to do it, right? Um, for most people, unless you have a super rigid foot, then this is the way to start. Make sure your ankles aren't collapsing and you're pushing weight off the outside edge of your feet. Heels away all day. Don't let your heels come in. But again, that's, I mean, there's nuances to that as well. I think what you mentioned is really the easiest starting point. Yeah. I mean, and Gota has so much good free information. If you just go to uh, YouTube, for example, and search G-O-A-T-A, and look up their YouTube stuff. Like they're starting to really pump out more content. Uh, one of their coaches, Bam, is doing a bunch of cool edited videos, but then they also have tutorial videos of the basics. Like you can just go check it out. Most of their stuff is free. They just like, they have a goal of, you know, fixing people's biomechanics so that 
less surgeries are happening in the world. So their mission is to save the world's connective tissue, right? So um, you can check out, like start with the basics, just learn their, their locomotion patterns. And then from there, you can start to branch out and explore a little bit more. I think the roping is really, really good because that gives you a good understanding of the spinal understanding. Then if you want to get into some upper body stuff, maybe go check out David Weck um, and some functional patterns because functional patterns, again, like what I see their results, they have really good fluid results with the sling systems. And then through the shoulders for running mechanics, David Weck has some really fun stuff. And a lot of the stuff that he does is just fun. You know, it's a lot of rhythmic, elastic, fun, bouncy stuff. Um, you, you combine that with like maybe functional patterns, um, 10 week course or the, or the functional training system for if you have a cable machine handy at, at your gym, like that's a really, really cool way to start throwing some intensity into some of the ways that you train. You can get some like really good gains while also honoring some of the rotary components of the human body. So that's kind of like, you know, if we're, if we're looking at, uh, it's, it's not like, one system is better than the other. I just think like sequentially, they kind of make sense to kind of do one after the other. Um, you know, I think functional patterns is kind of missing that lower body mechanics thing that it, it, it's missing the rotary model of the pivot point of the foot specifically. So I would start with, because your feet are the thing that touches the ground and movement starts from the ground. I would say learn go to system first because they're, we're taught with ground up approach, right? Like start with Gota, move into some WEC method, roping specifically so you can start working your spinal engine and then maybe get into functional patterns and, and other WEC method stuff so that you have more efficiency through the upper body and some uh, you know some more nuanced approach to training the sling systems and the fascial lines in the upper body those would kind of be like if i was going to sequence it that's that's the way i would do it now yeah i i agree um i'm not as much of a fan as most with the uh functional patterns bar stuff or cable stuff only because it's too complex for most people like the getting there is pretty tough but i mean that's just my opinion on it right he has simpler stuff too right like i mean I'm, like in his actual functional training course there's there's a whole host of them there's like very basic stuff and he does the same thing he'll isolate the components of it and then yeah. as you get better at it you move to the more complex things some of the stuff that you see it kind of looks like you're dancing with a cable but you know, you work up to that level of complexity the same way you would work up to like a heavy bench press if you're if you're training powerlifting. You would work up to some of these more complex rotary movements. Um, you know, some like honestly, the things that I do basically are just I'll do some some cross chop things and I'll I'll do a pull and then I'll twist into a press. Like I don't know, it's it's I I don't use a lot of the complex movements that he does, and I don't have I don't feel the need to work up to them either. I don't necessarily think they're helping me any more than even the basics would be. You can get really good at the basics and still get a ton of benefit from them, right? That said, those are, you know, that's that's sort of like, these, this is the starting point. And the point that I really liked that we made today was that you your movement practice should ultimately lead you to some more fun and exploratory. You should be marveled by your body and its capacities and the, and the nuances that you're able to draw out of it in movement should be something that fascinates you. Which, if you take that sort of curious, inquisitive approach to it, your experience is just going to be infinitely better, way, way more fun. And that's kind of where I wanted to leave it off today. Was you know I wanted to dive into those three systems because we only peripherally talked about them yesterday. We talked way more about bodybuilding, powerlifting, CrossFit. Uh, I do still want to do a whole episode on CrossFit, by the way. Because CrossFit oh yeah, is definitely. Still, it's we could get more into any... our hearts. For sure. Yeah. And by, and by the way, guys, we record these on nofilter.net. We just noticed, uh, I noticed there's a new face in here. There's Noah Thomas, who I've never seen attending these before. So hi, Noah. Thanks for watching live on nofilter.net. Um, if you ever want to ask us questions live, we have a chat box and there's the knock function that you can, you can hit the knock button and then you can join the stream yourself if you want to ask questions, if you want to debate, if there's things that you disagree with. Um, you know, it's, it's funny at this point, we've, we're, we're at 17 episodes and I'm still waiting for a good troll <laughs> to come on and challenge some of our ideas. Like I'm, I'm like, I'm waiting for the haters, man. I'm waiting for the haters. But in the meantime, it's really, and, and it can be a discussion too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's the whole point. We want, we, we don't want just people agreeing with us either. If you do agree with us, wonderful. If your mind is expanded by these ideas or you're thinking deeper, amazing that's that's 100 the the goal of these of these podcasts 
Um, but we're open to healthy debate at any point. We're going to try and get some guests on in the future that don't necessarily agree with our approach 100%. I know we got Keegan Smith next December. I think it's December 21st. We're going to talk to him. He's the co-founder of the ATG system along with Knees Over Toes guy, Ben Patrick. So we're going to talk to him. Uh, and then we're going to get some other, maybe some rehab experts, some people who are very against this functional movement uh, movement. <laughs> And, uh, and we'll, we'll talk to people who are outside of the worlds that we're exploring. Uh, we talked to Range of Strength, Lucas Aaron, the other day, which was really, really informative. It was really fun. We talked about flexibility training. I still do Lucas's programming. Um, I, I think he's uh, like an absolute genius in terms of training flexibility and integrating it with strength. Um, and then for me, I've just been trying to figure out how do I integrate that with the functional principles that I've sort of applied myself to in terms of the lens of these go to functional patterns or uh, WEC method lens, you know, how, how can I apply this to spinal engine? How can I apply this to inside ankle bone high, et cetera. So that's, uh, you know, this is episode 17 guys. Thank you so much for listening. Again, if you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, uh, quickly just subscribe to us, leave us a little rating. We love hearing from you guys. If you have any questions, you can shoot me a message at media at nofilter.net or you can find Will on at the art of move on Instagram. For everyone listening, thank you so much for checking it out. And go see our upcoming episodes live on www.nofilter.net. My name is Anthony Emanuel. You can search me up on the host page and all our upcoming streams will be listed there. Thanks again, guys. That's episode 17 in the bank. Have a good one, guys.